everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you were enjoying rain a little while ago. I envy you. I'm just sitting here in this place, box of a room in the home. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. We are very excited to hear about uh, your journey about fish brain and um, a warm welcome to Startup Grind Stockholm. And I'd like to start that you are a serial entrepreneur and uh, you have a passion of building businesses. So tell us a little bit about your journey before fish brain. So first of all, uh, thanks and happy to be here and uh, good to see all of you on, in, in the chat here. Uh, but yeah, where do I start? I've been an entrepreneur for 15 something years, but that's actually not where I started out my career. I started out my career in academia. So I got a, believe it or not, a, a degree in, in mathematics and physics, I got a master's and then I went straight for a PhD in AI. Uh, note, this is long before the hype, so this is not for joining the, the AI bandwagon or something like that. It's actually for genuine interest in mathematics and physics. So I did that for a few years, spent a, one year in, in Copenhagen Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics, which was really hardcore. <laughs> uh, I studied a lot, but also, this is, come on, this is Denmark, so I also drank a lot of beer. So it was a good combination <laughs> of work, work, studying super hard and drinking quite a few beers. But then... I uh, moved uh, over to Santa Fe uh, and the Santa Fe Institute, which is in New Mexico, which is this, it's a fantastic, it's a very small cross-disciplinary institute where they're famous in economy, biology, mathematics, and physics. And so I did part of my PhD over there. And there I was, I got super excited because I was, and also remember I was 20 something. So I was also very young and very naive uh, and now, now I'm just naive. I'm not young anymore. But, <laughs> but uh, because some of these professors over there, not not just were they fantastic in what they did, they, some mm -hmm. of them, many of them, also started a couple of companies. <laughs> some of them quite successfully. It's this American entrepreneurial spirit. So, uh, and and again, me being young and naive, I thought, hey, I can do the same. And uh, so I thought that while continuing my PhD, I would launch a startup and do run both in parallel. And of course, that didn't work out. Of course, it didn't. And so it's I was successful with the the, the startup because that actually took off, but uh, that was my end, the end of my career in academia. So I never finished my PhD. I don't have a mm -hmm. doctoral degree. I don't think I will ever pick it up again. But you know, you never know. Mm -hmm. But not as it looks here. But I started a company. Uh, long story short, but it, it was all using AI for solving computer problems, and raised some venture capital there and. Every startup is a roller coaster. It's there's definitely we definitely had a, quite a few ups and downs, but somehow don't ask me how, but we managed to get profitable, which is almost unheard of these days. Even if you're Spot Spotify have have had some yeah. like, quarter, quarters where they're actually profitable, in, but in, but in general they're not. Uh, but with that company, I moved to Silicon Valley in mm -hmm. 2007. And then we got some good momentum. We got some big corporate clients like at and mm -hmm. uh, Symantec, uh, even uh, Microsoft as a customer. And since we did, we did for the Windows, what we did was for the Windows operating system, mm -hmm. we thought it doesn't get any better than this. So we used a banker and then the business was acquired by a company in, uh, on the East Coast, outside okay. Boston. So, which was good. So I moved and le left after many years in Silicon Valley. I left for the East Coast, for Boston. And then I was locked in for a year and a half, which is pretty typical when you sell a business. There's always a lock-in period because they believe the buyer think you are so important for the business, which is not the case. I was definitely not important for that business any longer. I might have been in the early days, but 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 not, not seven, eight years after. But anyhow... So, and I felt pretty much immediately, this is, this is not where I want to end my life. Nothing wrong with the buyer, was, but mm -hmm. it was one of those big companies and, and focus was so it's growing the business one, two, two percent per year. Okay. Yeah. I like when you're growing hundred percent plus per year. That's the <laughs> exciting, exciting part now, not the one to two percent growth per year phase. And, but during that time, I could do angel investing. So I mm -hmm. invested in a bunch of companies. I joined boards. I did speaking gigs. But coming to today's topic, I actually spent a fair bit of time thinking about what should be my next company. And 
and um, given my background in mathematics and physics, physics, I think in numbers. I, so I was thinking about what are the next macro trends that I believe in. Okay. And of course, it's not I have a crystal ball that uh, you don't have or in uh, uh, Sequoia or Greylock or in Dries and mm. Horowitz or Goldman Sachs. But come on, you know, you know that you will work for the next five to 10 years with uh, little or no pay in the first year and mm-hmm. huge risk. And the most likely outcome is that you will fail. <laughs> mm-hmm. But uh, you have, you have, at least you have to believe in it. So yeah. I came to two conclusions that I think are pretty obvious today. They weren't uh, seven years ago when we started Fishbrain. And the, not, the first one is if you have a passion for something, doesn't matter wh- what it is. If it's if it's uh, cooking or if it's sailing or it's if it's photography or whatever, uh, you will have a much better engagement. I think if you're in a group of like-minded or peers versus a group mm-hmm. of friends, because if you look at uh, if 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 you post a speciality content on like a Facebook or an Instagram or a TikTok, you get very, very low engagement yeah. because. These are designs for friends. So this type of content that works on these platforms are content that everyone can engage with and appreciate, like party pictures, food, um, mm-hmm. kitten, kittens, and stuff like that. And also from a user behavior perspective, it's a browse experience. You look at the feed, if, mm-hmm. if this is Instagram or, or TikTok or Facebook, there's no search behaviors. That means that there, these, these platforms are not designed for evergreen content. And then when you go vertical, there's a bunch of content that's, that's evergreen, that's relevant, not just today, but relevant a year from now or two years from now and, and stuff like that. And also, I'm actually old enough to be in and seeing that see, when, when the web was bigger than mobile, there were mm. those super successful and very highly engaged use, online user forums. Mm-hmm. with millions and millions of monthly active users. They sort of went away when Facebook came. And they, yes, there were groups. You can tag stuff on Instagram, but it doesn't really connect this, uh, this, this group of like-minded people. So that was number one. Number two, that I am a big believer in, I think there are a lot of untapped business opportunities around crowdsourcing of data, especially mm-hmm. using this, the mobile device. Mm-hmm. And of course, like your Facebook, they use it for targeting ads. And if you look at their quarterly report they do pretty okay over there in mm-hmm. Menlo Park mm-hmm. but personally I really like businesses like Waze where you crowdsource traffic information and you deliver a, a, fant- a great service uh, for the customers I use it every day in San Francisco and Boston I don't need it in Stockholm <laughs> but, but it's, <laughs> if you think there's traffic in Stockholm go to San Francisco mm-hmm. or Boston but uh, but again I think there are a lot of these opportunities so I actually wrote a blog post saying that I thought there would be an opportunity around vertical social networks, Mm -hmm. and especially for the hobbies and passions where you can actually take this data, crowdsource a data set directly from the customers, the users, and uh, turn it back as a service for the uh, the users. And this was published by this Silicon Valley tech blog, Pando Daily. Mm -hmm. And I got a ton of feedback. I got feedback directly from Mark Andreessen at Andreessen Horowitz. Mm -hmm. I got feedback from Sequoia. I got feedback from Greylock. Oh, basically everyone that invested in Facebook. So, uh, <laughs> so I say, hey, I might be on, on, onto something here. And mm. the thing is, I'm not an avid angler. I know how to fish. There are a lot of articles saying mm. that I'm not a fisherman. That's, uh, that's actually not true. But it's not my biggest passion. I've been a competitive uh, cyclist for 10 years. I'm, I'm definitely okay. better, even though I suck at it today. But when I was, when I was younger and less fat, I was, I was <laughs> quite good at cycling. But, but, so I looked at the number of verticals, and mm. the reason I decided to start going to fishing, there were a couple of reasons. First of all, it was there was this article in Forbes listing the world's 10 largest hobbies, and guess what? <laughs> Sports fishing was number one. Mm. Uh, this is There are 50 million Americans that fish every year. They spend $50 billion every year. To put the number mm. in perspective, the global music industry is a $20 billion industry. So there are many, they spend a boatload of money. Uh, it's also very global. It's big in China, it's big in Brazil, Russia, in many countries in Europe, Sweden, definitely for sure. Mm-hmm. But there's also a lot of, this is a very, when looking vertical, you really have to have content that a users are willing to share and ideally yeah. already do this today so you don't have to change a user behavior. And that content has to be visual because people, they don't, 
have limited bandwidth and, and attention span is limited, uh, that content has to be either images, photos, or ideally videos. Mm. Just look at TikTok is a perfect example of yeah. that, which is with 100% video based. And that's that's definitely the case in fishing because most fishing is catch and release, meaning that the, the, the angler doesn't keep the fish. So that means already today, they're all, all always taking a picture or increasingly so a video. So the content is there. Mm. And then the opportunity I saw around the, the day on the data side is the fact that if you ask 100 avid anglers when, where, and how to fish, you will get exactly 100 different answers. And okay. the, the ex-mathematician in me told me that cannot be right. It's just because that one angler can, can only fish that much, similar to one, on, on one driver can only drive that much. But if you aggregate a lot of uh, mm. traffic data, you can actually draw conclusions from that. So okay. at Fishbrain, we, we started to gather a ton of very, very granular sport fishing data, mm -hmm. not just the location and species, but also the method, uh, what was the weather, was it sunny, was it cloudy, what's the moon phase, the tide, the current, the humidity, air pressure, water temperature, wind speed, wind direction, humidity, boom, everything. And then we apply machine learning. And now seven years later, uh, we have a, a scientific fishing forecast, which is basically the the blockbuster and the the, the key uh, selling point in our sub, in our subscription version. So, so yeah, somewhere that academic side came out, like uh, that, ah, that method and, and also uh, the AI side that you talked about. So I think it reflected. So I think it's really, really, really uh, amazing how uh, this journey has been. And and uh, what I really liked when you started talking about that you had that time with you and then you started studying those macro trends and then you had uh, a two-sided approach, like the passion side and then there was crowdsourcing data. Those were the two cuts. And suddenly there were also some market changes, which is, of course, the text went out of fashion when the web switched to mobile. So, so I think that's a huge change uh, or switch that happened. And many networks or many online services didn't evolve. So those who evolved or were able to catch on that trend, that was good. And I think you made a very deep uh, uh, point about social networks there when you said uh, that why are you on social network? Is it browse versus search? I think that's a very, very simple branching point which can determine what the... So really, really good. How were the early days of your venture? Like what were the struggles? What were the things which eventually led to what you are today? Like, for, for, First of all, I think every startup is a challenge. There, yeah. there it, every, I haven't seen one exception to that, including, including a Clarin and a Spotify and and even these today's super successful companies been through uh, they've all been roller coasters and so has fishbrain but in because the thing is and this is the way i think in general it's not a success is you don't have to be first we we were mm -hmm. definitely not the first we had 15 competitors when we started um, mm -hmm. so we we knew and that was spotify wasn't the first music service uh, Mm -hmm. There's been Klarna wasn't the first payment payment provider. There there's been uh, uh, Strava who's done this very, very successfully in in the cycling space. And I know the founder mm -hmm. Michael. They were not the first fitness app. They were planning before they started. So it's important to be the first to hit this this tipping point. It's critical mass of users. Okay. Because when you look at a vertical social, there is a brutal market dynamics mm -hmm. <laughs> because especially when when you, your service is built upon the data there's actually a double network effect because you want to be on the same platform as as the your buddies that also do the same hobby so if you're in cycling you want to be on the same platform as your your real world cycling buddies okay and same 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 with fishing you want to make sure that your real world fishing buddies are on the platform so there's there, first of all, you have the social graph, whether this is the, depending on the hobby, the fishing graph or the cycling graph mm -hmm. or the cooking graph or the photography graph or the baseball graph or whatever. Uh, but then you also want to be on the platform with the most amount of data. 
because that's that's how you do deliver value. Because look at look at waste. There have been so many companies trying to oh, there's a better take on traffic than waste, but no one has succeeded. Okay. And they struggle to get to the critical mass of users. That boom didn't happen overnight. They they worked for quite a few years before they actually hit this hit this tipping point. Mm. So for us, we knew in the very beginning that this would be a this would be a tough ride. And everyone told me this this will never work because look at Facebook, look at Instagram. Mm. Why there's no need for vertical social networks? It, I, yeah. I, 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 I told them, I think you're wrong. I think I'm right. As, you know, as a naive <laughs> entrepreneur, you're stubborn because otherwise you you get you get nowhere. Mm. But mm. we focused a lot on making. Uh, we took a different approach approach than our competitors. We actually focused on usability, not on features. So we had fewer features than our competitors, but we tried to make them easier to use. We work on the onboarding. We work more on the social side than on the utility side. And uh, but it's it's okay. it was by no means easy. And we uh, we raised venture capital early, uh, including Nordzone, who invested in Spotify and I think most most unicorns out of Scandinavia. And they're happy to have them. They've supported the business in multi multiple rounds, including the latest. But the thing, since we had competition, we knew we needed to be the first one to hit mm. this critical mass of users. And the network effects are actually local. Okay. So even if even if I decided after being out of uh, the country for many many years, we moved back to Sweden and start a company in Stockholm, not in Silicon Valley. Okay. And we can talk about that later because yeah. I think there's. I'm very happy today that I did. But it absolutely wasn't obvious seven years ago that Stockholm was actually the place to start start a company. Mm. But today, mm. I'm happy I did that choice and not move back to Silicon Valley. But that that also meant because these strong network effects and since they are local, even though we started the company in Sweden, we went immediately for the market we knew we needed to win, which is the U.S. market. Okay. So, which is very very unSwedish. Most Swedes they. Or a company start here. They start in the local market. They want to. I, I hate the word MVP, but whatever. They want. They want to get a, a working product and some mm -hmm. revenue, and then they scale. We said, screw that. Let's go for the biggest market mm -hmm. first. We don't have time to learn in the Swedish market. But that's a very and, interesting point about MVP because the entire. Uh, advisory industry structures, the accelerators, the startups, they're always focusing you on developing a very narrow, a very narrow tunnel which can be validated multiple points and then you kind of go, like almost you are like treading on the rope, carefully, carefully, carefully. So I don't know. Uh, we yeah. had an opposing view to that when we interviewed Magnus Grimland from Antler mm -hmm. a few uh, months ago. And he was on the other side. He was like, it's the passion, it's the drive that's the, yeah. I mean, the, I think the, I think you can combine the best of both because okay. I think there's there's definitely passion needed. And if, if mm. you're not bold, I don't think you get anywhere okay. because it's today it's fiercely competitive. Mm. You're fighting not with, we, today we're not fighting with direct competitors. We're fighting with people's bandwidth in general. So I think mm. you have to be bold. I think what's, being too data driven or MVP, it's it's so easy you get stuck speaking in mathematical terms in a local mm. local maxima, because you're optimizing here, but yeah. it might be here's the global maxima, yeah. and being so at Fishbrain and also at, at all the other companies that I'm advising, it's it's you, yes we you should 100% be data driven. I'm not saying that you should screw data, mm. of course not, mm. but you should know where okay here's if this is a funnel that, that you want to optimize. Or do you actually think there's some a, a bigger maxima somewhere else? So I think you need to find a healthy balance between optimizations and big bets. Mm -hmm. knowing, knowing the majority of bets will fail, but if mm -hmm. you don't make these big bets, you will be stuck at the local maxima for sure. Mm -hmm. And what I don't like in the MVP, how, do, how can I actually know? What's the minimum? I know there are so many companies that have given up because they, they maybe they should have done one more iteration because Maybe it wasn't, if, if they worked on it for one more week or one more month, mm. depending on how complex it is, they could have struck gold. Uh, but of course, there's always also cases where they work too long and they should have given up because they were not even close to having something, something, mm. a, 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 a market fit here. But well, it, I think, again, I think in, the, in the early, early stages, it's 100% it's, it's passion. 
Mm-hmm. And, and very important point when you looked at the U.S. market, because I'm trying to create a very simple analogy for our listeners. So you cannot actually judge your own interest in jogging if you are jogging in your room. You won't get the feeling. You need to change the context. So maybe at an MVP stage, maybe you are too much hard boxed into something. So it's very important to think outside the box and see where this can work. But amazing points over there. Um, you 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 touched about the point of Stockholm uh, a little bit while you were discussing, and you have been in multiple ecosystems. You have worked in US as well. Um, my point is, how do you see Stockholm versus? other ecosystems or, uh, for example, US where you have worked? Are we too conservative? Are we too methodical? I'm just putting a few words there. Maybe we can start. <laughs> I think like any city, there are pros and cons with every with every city or every startup hub. Mm-hmm. And I've been working in three. I've been working in Stockholm. I've been an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and in mm-hmm. Boston. So I've tried three different places. Okay. I cannot, cannot speak about the others. <laughs> Okay. But uh, when I left Sweden 2007, it was really, really hard to be an entrepreneur in Stockholm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, there hadn't been that many uh, successes. Because I definitely think that success breeds success. Yeah. Uh, basically, Nikla Sandstrom of Skype was the only one uh, back then. And, uh, and there wasn't... The, so the, the talent pool was really small. There, were, there weren't that many people that actually built successful companies, at mm-hmm. least not at scale which meant that there were also not that much venture capital there. So it was, there were a lot of different constitu- constituents that didn't exist in Stockholm. So hence my, why I, I knew I needed to, for, for, for growing my first company big, you needed to move to Silicon Valley because mm-hmm. everything in tech more or less gravitated towards that. Uh, but now I think things are very, very different in Stockholm mm-hmm. in, a po- in a positive way. I think there are, First of all, there are definitely multiple successes. There are a lot of unicorns, I, whatever. But successful companies in, 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 in general, it's not about the valuation. But I think they mm. built a lot of great, great companies in Stockholm. Spotify, Klarna, you have the King. There's, there's, there's a bunch of them. And there's also a very, very good pay it forward attitude. A lot of these entrepreneurs, they help the next generation by not just by investing a little bit, some angel investing, but also with with advice and opening opening up their network. Good example for Fishman is Daniel Eck has been super helpful for me doing some introductions. Super thankful for that, which were they were key in the early days. And now I built my own network. So I, I try to pay it forward as 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 much as much as I can. And also with success also comes money <laughs> because yeah. when they see that, oh, there's actually a value created, be money created for investors here. Of course, that attracts more money into the ecosystem. So I would say now, at least in the early stages, there's a lot of uh, capital available, both from at, at an angel uh, phase, at the seed, seed, pre-seed and seed round and an A round. Okay. A little bit less so when it comes to scaling a company like a b or c Mm -hmm. run we we did our series sorry fishbrain we started our series b that was the first round that was actually globally led and not uh, not locally led Mm -hmm. and uh but i think in the early stages there is definitely plenty of capital available here then of course not everything is great in stockholm Uh, and i think this is this is i think again even though I, I lived in the States for many years, that doesn't make me American. I suck at marketing. I think Swedes in general suck at marketing. Okay. This is America. It's really, really hard to beat an American when it comes to marketing. And mm. uh, but you have to you then you have to compensate for that. Our CMO at Fishburne, Lisa Kennelly, she's American. She, mm-hmm. She's based here in Stockholm. But uh, I think what what you couldn't really do 10 years ago was to attract talent to come to Stockholm. Now you can, yeah. you can. So we have like, I think we have 15, 15 people that are Americans working mm-hmm. in the office in Stockholm. And that's, okay. that's, that would never happen in 2007 for sure. It was impossible to attract anyone to come to Stockholm, at least as an entrepreneur in 2007. Mm-hmm. Today it's very, very different. So it's the evolution so, but again, but again, on the on, on sales and marketing in general, I, I should just shouldn't generalize, but it, we suck, we suck at it compared to America. We suck. At, we're good at tech. We're semi good at product, but we're not very good at uh, good, good at sales and marketing. And you should know that. And we are because when 
speaking about monetization on the Fishman platform, we always have these debates in turn. Oh, should we really should we really charge for that? Should we, shouldn't that feature be free? <laughs> Those discussions wouldn't exist in Silicon Valley. But boom, fuck, let's put it behind the paywall. Behind the paywall, it's all about monetization. So it's it's yeah. So, so it's it's marketing, and I think that that's a very interesting point that you make because even at a very early stage startup level, people sit on ideas. They don't so validation, talking to customer. That's also a fear. Many startups at very early stage have that fear wall. So you need to break yeah. that fear wall, which becomes your firewall to growth somehow. So I think uh, marketing is key at an early stage, and it's really good. Um, Building Fishbrain in early stage versus where it is now, what are the differences or what are the similarities? Like you have worked it, at, uh, mm-hmm. you created it, and then you are on it and you uh, raised 263 million crowns recently. Uh, that was uh, out in the media. How is it different between those two stages? What's the main difference between those two stages? Mm-hmm. Uh, there are definitely differences and similarities mm-hmm. uh, because I, I need to talk about a little bit about the evolution of the company to, to put this in okay. perspective. Because the first three years, I think I mentioned, we didn't monetize because we knew we needed to hit this critical mass of users and uh, the tipping point ahead of the competition. Mm-hmm. So then it was very, very product focused, not on monetization, but actually getting a decent enough user experience. Of, we are not just getting users, but they also stick around. So we're looking at, looking at retention and, and, and growing that user base first. Mm. Then we, I think three, four years ago, we turned on monetization through a subscription. And it's a freemium model. So it's free to download Fishman, but if you want to have access to data, mm. uh, that's behind the paywall. So which which meant we, again, needed to innovate. We Because then so, the social side, which was the free side, was... was you, it never really works as well as you want it to, frankly. But mm-hmm. but again, it's sort of worked good enough for us to raise some money and actually get to the next stage. But then we needed to innovate again on the uh, on on the paid side. How do we actually get subscribers? Going from an audience business, adding a subscription, which is it, frankly that wasn't that hard. But then again, so we did that for a couple of years. Now we needed, and then it become to a stage where. Now it's more about optimizing that again. Looking at Fishbrain today, here again, it, it's less innovation. It's more, oh, we have a roadmap. We know here are the things we need to do. Uh, we do a lot of A-B testing here around different messaging, paywalls, uh, price points. Uh, so on, on that side of the house, it's it's more in a stage where we want to continue to grow at the 50, 100% growth rate. Mm. but mostly through optimizations and, and adding value. But then we added a new thing. This is, again, uh, a year and a half ago or something like that, which is a second revenue stream. And this is absolutely not rocket science because if we can, if we can, or the only one that can give recommendations, if you want to go fish for, say, say trout in Lake Tahoe in California in, mm. in May, here's the best equipment to do that job. It's a pretty darn good commerce opportunity. Yeah. So we we and and again, me being not all uh, young anymore, but but naive, still naive. Uh, that was uh, oh we with the yeah, hey, let's build a marketplace because we don't want to have an e-commerce model where we take the inventory risk and limited supply and stuff like that. So let's build this on the marketplace model. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was hard. <laughs> it took, <laughs> took more than a year more than a year to build. Because then you have to integrate with all the 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 sellers and mm. and and product images and descriptions and price points and stock levels and paying tax in the mm. US is actually different by zip code. So, so but again, so I would say where we are right now, it's it's here. It's a, still a lot about innovation. Mm. Uh, it's a, it's a tiny revenue stream compared to our subscription revenue stream. So okay. one side of the business is innovating, mm. the other is more optimizing. And that makes it actually hard in a company to run two fundamentally different approaches. Mm. One where you actually need to really invent, come up with, here's, it's not about optimizing. It's actually doing bigger things, making quite bold bets. Where on the subscription Mm. side, we also, it's more optimization because we, we, here we also cannot screw things up. 
mm-hmm. because we we cannot jeopardize the revenue stream uh, revenue stream so it's uh, we have to be a little bit more careful on on that side still need to improve and we want to make things better and reduce the churn and increase conversion and stuff like that but it, but on the marketplace on the commerce side here's 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 more innovation and and in your experience, what's the because of course you've been dealing with it for uh, past one and a half year when you went into the marketplace model, is it the entire team works on two sides or do you need to have different teams working on two th- uh, on those two things? And then how do you integrate them up into the business? Uh, a great question, and which is very hard. But the way we are structured, not saying that that's the right structure, <laughs> but that's the way we run is we have cross-functional teams. Mm-hmm. And these are teams with around uh, eight people. Uh, okay. And so they have a target that they run with. One can be a commerce target. One can be a subscription subscription revenue target. And they are more or less have, have all the flexibility to whatever needed to actually hit their targets. Okay. Of course, that doesn't mean that every organization is a matrix organization. If if mm. you're not, you're lying. Because of course, you cannot build on completely. The one team cannot work on a completely different UI, UX, fonts, look and feel, technology, everything. So there is we have gills between the teams. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there has to be syncs between the teams. But I think what's most important, even at our stage now, it's it's, it's about velocity. If if, okay. if someone runs runs faster, they will beat you. So of course, of course, you you can. If if everything is completely aligned, that slows you down. You don't get the velocity you want. And does that does that make the shit hit the fan? Of course it does. <laughs> but you can you cannot have everything. Life is give and take. You have you have. If 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 you prioritize velocity, then there will be some 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 things that will happen because of that. But that's part of, of, of this. But you definitely we definitely have different teams. We don't have mm-hmm. one team working on two revenue streams. Do you have uh, okay. d- different teams working on different facets of the business? We also have team working on, for example, retention of free users. Okay. So we have d- different different metrics. Every, every team should have one or two metrics that they run after. I think that's good. The point on velocity and matrix uh, based teams. Great. Um, let's jump to, so we discussed team and how you're structured, how uh, how you're following the innovation side as well as the optimization side. So two legs. So I think it's very, very interesting. If we go a little bit about uh, your, uh, into your funding journey, because initially you said uh, you hit revenues much later. So initial two to three years was about building that critical mass of users and that's also very interesting because many startups are faced with a fundamental question what's the best way to b- build this business should we build the community first how big the community needs to be and then what's the investor interest what were your challenges in your the in your journey of critical mass building let's take that stage uh, mm-hmm. when you were uh, trying to achieve that and you didn't have big numbers on the revenue side to show I think here you definitely need to look at what 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 are the VCs investing in right now. And the challenge I had is that not very many people believe. Now everyone talks about the unbundling of social. There's mm-hmm. a fantastic article series by uh, uh, Andreessen Horowitz around this. They call it Social Plus, okay. the next the next generation of social. Not very many investors actually believed in that. In in uh, I think we had our first app in the market 2013. This is okay. eight years ago, time flying. So yeah. I, I, I definitely needed to convince the investors that there's business here. The unbundling will happen. So okay. I had to spend a lot of time storytelling and, and very, very happy to have both. Uh, we had Swedish Industry Fonden uh, and, and North Zone. They made a huge bet at a very, very early stage in Fishman, which I'm super grateful for. Uh, mm. Today, I think it's actually much easier to for now talking specifically about vertical social, mm-hmm. because a lot of investors do believe in this macro trend. We have one investor that invested in Fishbrain came in 2018, two year, two or three years ago. Then there was B Capital, and uh, they're less than known. They have two basically in the first fund. They have two limited partners. One was BCG, the consulting firm. The other was the, the lesser-known uh, Facebook co-founder, Eduardo Severin. 
uh, so he's been highly engaged in Fishbrain, and and he's definitely seen seen Facebook from the inside, and okay. he is he is a strong believer in the unbundling of social, uh, and same with the other investor that came in into the uh, our Series B was SoftBank. Okay. It was also a, a macro trend driven investment in Fishbrain because they they believed in two macro trends. One, one is the uh, vertical commerce and okay. and the unbundling of social, so vertical social. Uh, so I think today you don't have to spend time convincing the uh, VCs that there is actually business to be made in vertical social. There are so many examples of billion dollar plus valuation companies in vertical social, but then you have to compensate. So they buy into that, but then you have to show some numbers. You have to show. Uh, no, in the early stages, it's not it's not about revenues. It's about how how do you get users and how do you get them to stick around. Okay. So con- conversion funnel and and uh, retention cohorts. Okay. So getting users and getting them to stick around. But I think what I picked up here was something very interesting which you were mentioning, and I was just jotting down a few few words. Like you had to go very deep into the trends and how social was uh, kind of taking shape at that time. So that's one learning, and uh, I'll come back to the community on that side. And the other thing was that you went around and put a lot of focus on storytelling, and then these people came in and made the bets. So I think for the journal entrepreneurship community who is uh, listening to us today, this is very, very important. When you are, and and, uh, remember, Yuan started with a word uh, when we were talking about social networks, word passion. So the passion needs to be there. If you have a passion, connect it, go out and search trends, what can you identify in the market which makes you unique? But then you said that you really don't need to be uh, the only one out there. There could be a situation when there are other players already in the market, in many cases, more than 10 players. But then what makes it important uh, for others to jump on the bandwagon is your storytelling, the power of your uh, your team or yourself to show a vision, which is promising. So really, really great points. Um You're also involved, uh, you said that you have been involved in boards and other startups, and um, you're also involved in Sting. Tell me about that experience, how how that is, you're uh, part of the ecosystem building process. How is that coming along? I think it's, it's, I I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, I, I, I know I don't know everything. And I think that's, that's, some entrepreneurs that think they know everything, and I don't think that's very healthy. And first of all, it's it's never true <laughs> to, to to start with. So I actually, of course, over the years you accumulate some knowledge. You've seen mm-hmm. you've seen 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 things working, and also seen a lot of things not working because most things don't work. That's that's just the nature of the game. Uh, so, but but also I learn a lot from being on board. I learn a lot. Of, you mentioned Sting. I'm on the advisory board of Sting. Then you get to see a lot of uh, Sting companies there and they're pitching. And and and, and I also learn with because the, the way I'm doing things or we are doing things, it's the Fishman is definitely not a one-man band. We have fantastic people. Mm. But it doesn't make the thing we are doing things right. It's it's. I think I get a lot of inspiration working with uh, smaller some smaller and bigger companies. You, so you get... and. It's not like there are any competitions. It's not that. It's not like, <laughs> so it's it's it's, uh, and I think that it's it's over. Uh, people don't talk enough about the importance of stellar execution. It's it's mm-hmm. it's idea is important, but it, but again, someone said five percent. But I don't really. It's, you cannot put a number that five percent idea, ninety five percent execution. I think it's wrong to call it that. But mm-hmm. whatever. I think it's 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 about execution, and you see mm-hmm. how how other companies do, do things and what's working for them. Now, for sure, that there's been. With uh, COVID nineteen, where we had an almost one hundred percent, or almost we had a one hundred percent on site culture, mm. boom! In 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 a week, we went from working in the office to not at all working in the office. Now we're sort of a hybrid. I think that it's a definitely helped me seeing how other companies, both in Sweden and in mm. in in the states, have tackled that. So I don't think, in general, I I don't think we should, as an entrepreneur, you should in you should be innovative where innovation is needed. Mm. The rest, learn from the best. Copy, copy. I I take pride in not inventing everything on our own, for sure. Uh, but but again, coming back, it sounds like a Swedish melon milk. But it's it's finding the right balance. 
it's, it's also identifying where you need to be innovative. Of, mm. of, coming back to Fishman, of course, so the social is very, very important part of Fishman because fishing is so bragging driven. That doesn't mean that we can just copy the things that are working on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram. Mm. We have to take the basics, yes, but we need to put a twist to it. It cannot just be, but some parts like direct messaging, it, direct messaging is direct messaging. It's no, well, no, no need for innovation. Groups are groups. It's so, so again, it's, it's finding this, this, where do we not need to innovate and where do right. we need to, to, to innovate? So we, 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 uh, we we actually have uh, uh, one, one 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 of the principles at Fishman is innovate core and copy the rest, which is <laughs> which is always easier is easier said than done because what's really core and what's but 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 again, but it's a great point that you make that uh, I think uh, innovation for the sake of innovation to the extent that you limit yourself inside a box is always. Uh, going to be a challenge it'll have huge costs if you're trying to create everything on your own so i think uh, your point makes sense it also makes entrepreneurs focus on sensing the market whatever is out there whatever is working take that and then try uh, and put your own uh, brand to that or your own way to that and the word brand over there uh, what's the marketing strategy how how important is marketing in building a startup like yours uh, did you like go in uh, creating a very, very distinct brand identity, like really, really thought like mm. marketers or did the startup itself had, the product itself had enough appeal to appeal to the market because it was the vertical uh, that made sense to people. So something over there, if you could shed light on. For sure. And here, this is, uh, here I will speak specifically for vertical social because I think the go to market mm. strategy is completely different in different, uh, for, for different businesses. So here, this is an example where generalizing is, is super dangerous. Mm. Mm. But, but for us, it has been, we have in, the, I would say in the early stage, it's been very, very product driven. Okay. Uh, uh, we sucked again. Coming back, sucked at marketing. We didn't. We didn't really put a lot of of effort into building the brand. Mm. Uh, and it it wasn't like it's it's. You can only focus on that many things, especially in the early days when you are very very few people. Now we are over hundred people. So now now we are starting to build, think, uh, and uh, have brilliant people that actually work work on the brand. But in the early days, you don't really have the luxury to be good at everything. But mm. you need to decide where do you want to be, re where do you have to be really good? Okay. And we decided on the product, but that doesn't mean, and I think this is, this is a little bit, everyone's looking, oh, it's asking about how viral is your growth. I said, screw that. This is, again, it's, it's about how can you actually, what is the go-to-market strategy? How can you grow user base? Mm. Then it's always a question of whether is your LTV lifetime value greater mm. than your CAC customer acquisition cost? If that's true, then you are you are stupid if you don't put more money into marketing and mm. and if you can retain a positive unit economics where LTV is greater than CAC, you should be spending on marketing. I think that's a little bit and look at how many companies are truly viral today. Mm. <laughs> Not that many, and the ones that are, they definitely become unicorns and they become decacorns because mm. they basically won at least at scale. In the early days, you can always get you can always get some users, and you make the mistake of saying, "Oh, our, our mm. growth is is viral; hence, we will be we will be the global stuff to continue at the current trajectory, and we will be." <laughs> then you're yeah. fooling yourself. So, so if if you look at the, how the way we did it, so we we focused on the product, mm -hmm. but we also did paid user acquisitions on okay. Facebook and Google. We still do it. We still do it, and that we have positive unit economics, so we are spending quite some money. Okay. On, on still on paid user acquisition. We have organic growth for sure, but our growth is not just organic. Okay. And, and let's link it to your funding side. When you are raising funding, what has been the uh, pressure or directive from the investors or what has been your story at Switchbrain or you think a startup story needs to be uh, is the when you're building networks, like vertical networks like this, are you, it's, is it easier to get funded for traction or for building the product? Has that question come around? Of course it has. 
and and uh, here here you have to be you have to be clever as as, as an entrepreneur because uh, investors they want to be extremely data driven mm. uh, but again but but again you have to sell you have you have to be good at storytelling you have to sell them a vision because no matter which company you're looking at not all the metrics will be great that's not not even for the the super super valuable successful companies so i think you need to frame the discussions Okay, but but and and it's fundraising definitely depends on at what stage you're fundraising. If you look if you look at Angel, it's 100% storytelling. Then the degree of storytelling goes down for, okay. for, for every funding round. The the our previous uh, round where we raised quarter of a million sec, that mm-hmm. was less about still some storytelling, okay. but it's also very very metrics driven. We would not have been able to raise that round if we didn't have a working monetization strategy. Okay. Uh, we would not have been able to close that if we didn't have positive unit economics. Mm-hmm. So we are not profitable. So it's m- many companies at our stage aren't profitable, but mm-hmm. then you have to compensate that with 50% plus growth uh, year over year. Okay. So so I would say for every stage, if you start with 100% storytelling, <laughs> okay. by stage, it, 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 that, that goes down. But it's still important. And storytelling is still important because and there are a lot of investment opportunities for investors. So you still need to sell them on the vision why if you're looking at a VC funding, they want to see at least a 10x return on their money or an opportunity for 10x. That doesn't mean that every investment will, of course, return 10x uh, no. because some will fail. They, they, and it, it's why it's called venture capital. Some will fail. Uh, but then you have to tell them and show them why this can become uh, return 10x, 10x on their uh, on their investment. So it's a combination okay. of, of 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 showing strong numbers and storytelling. In the early days, it's 100% storytelling. Got it, got it. So I think that's a good uh, lesson for everyone. Initial stages, if you are very early stage, storytelling focus there. Um, I'll I'll bring in Marina now to get some audience questions. We have five, seven minutes to close on. So Marina, I'm putting you on presenter mode, if it's okay. Uh, let's see if we have some questions coming up. Uh, yes. Hold on, we can't hear you yet. Yeah. Yes, hello. Hi. <laughs> hi, Naimo, and hi, Johan. Hi. You, so uh, cool. Hey there. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. <laughs> Hi, now we're all set, I guess. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this super insightful conversation. I think Johan brought us such a fresh perspective, like the raw, entrep- raw entrepreneurship, like the real stories behind your, you know, amazing ventures and uh, yeah, ad- adventures actually. <laughs> Sounds super, super cool. And I saw in the chat that many felt that uh, were super inspiring to hear about your story. So I will just start with a question because we have some very good question and very little time. Um, so yeah, let's start with Mark. Uh, Mark was asking if you have any um, thought about talent, how to separate the weed from the chaff when it comes to uh, epiphanies, process mistakes. Uh, what's your take on talent in the, in the, in, yeah, in the startup process? It's a good, it's 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 a good question, but also a hard question because it 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 really depends on also coming back to at what stage you're at. Because when you're in the early stages, you 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 want more generalists. If you look at from a tech perspective, you maybe they they can work on both Android and iOS and backend. And uh, and as as you, as you grow now that we are more than hundred people, you are more your role become more narrow, and you can hire more specialists. So. In the, in the early days, you definitely want to find people that are willing to work 60, 80. And that, that, it's easy to talk about work-life balance, but in reality, in the early days, screw that. It, it, that's, that's, it's very competitive. That doesn't work. I wish, I wish that was the case. I think that's one reason that Silicon Valley is still, in some cases, better than Stockholm, because they are willing to roll up their sleeves and work like crazy. And speaking with the founding team of Facebook, it's not they weren't working 40 hours a week. 
Uh, but but again, at the state we're in right now, we need to find people that have done things before. We need to find a good mix between, I love to see people growing at Fishbrain. So it's not that we're just hiring senior people. We want to have a mix between junior and senior. So our CTO is coming from Spotify. It's great. He's been through that journey. Wanted, wanted to join something smaller. But we have also people coming fresh out of uh, univer- uni, university. So find, finding a good talent. But in the early days, you're definitely looking for the, the generalists that are definitely willing to work extremely hard. You still have to work hard at Fishman today. But again, it's, it's, it's different. It's, I would say that running a, a, a startup or a scale-up, it's, it's a marathon. But of course, there will sprint along the way. There will be weeks where definitely you need to work more than 40 hours. And, and I think what's, what's hard for many companies, as you scale, there are companies much bigger than Fishman. And how do you keep this, this entrepreneurial spirit in the company, which is super hard. No one has really been successful with, with that. And I don't think there's a recipe for it. But because you, you want to keep the entrepreneurial spirit as long as, absolute as long as you can. And I think breaking it down to smaller units, unit cells and stuff like that, that's, 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 that's definitely helped for us. Sounds great. Yeah, very good uh, perspective. So interesting layer with talent and uh, innovation and where to add velocity, as you said, in the hierarchy of where to innovate. Uh, definitely what type, what type of talent you have in which stage definitely maybe helps in that. Uh, I will move on to Patricia Alvarez's question. She has a very good uh, question about the future plans for Fishbrain when it comes to um, yeah, the climate crisis where like the, the major challenges with marine ecosystems and how you're contributing with the, yeah, with your great uh, data. Mm. Uh, uh, so it's this is this is I had I didn't think about this at all when we started the company, but now uh, seven eight years later, I'm very happy that we are actively contributing to to this, and in a number of ways. So first of all, we haven't engaged because because anglers they care a lot about the environment. These 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 are outdoors people. So one way we're doing is, is we're actually leveraging this community. So we had one initiative where we partnered up with Keep America Tidy. So we told our users uh, during this weekend, when you're out fishing, why don't you clean the waters? And we have hundreds of thousands of waters in the state being cleaned by our community. So I think the power of a community that, that, that cares enormously about the environment, that, that, that's a good thing. Second, since basically almost all fish, a lot of fishing today is catch and release. Uh, we work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service around endangered species because unfortunately there are endangered species. And when, so when a user tries to log a catch and fish brain of an endangered species, which we identify from the picture using image recognition, which we co-develop in Google, which is super cool, we can tell the user, this is an endangered species. Please consider doing catch and release. And then we share that they... We share that data back with the, that organization so they can actually much, much better track the health of these endangered species. Okay. In Florida, they have the opposite problem. They have more problems with invasive species instead of uh, endangered species. So here, if a user catches uh, an invasive species, the recommendation is <laughs> kill it, not practice and catch and release. And then they can see how these invasive species are spreading and they can take measures based on that. So we share data with uh, a lot of resource organizations around this. We do this pro bono. We don't charge for that. That's We made a board decision to, we don't charge for that. Of course, all the data is anonymized. We don't, we'd never share any personal information, but I'm very happy that we contribute with that. But, but frankly, I didn't think about that from the beginning. So it's, it's, I won't make that up. It's, it's just, it's just happy to, that we are today, but we didn't, we didn't think about that in the beginning. Yes, so, so great. Actually, you built something that uh, yeah, will help a lot in what's coming next uh, when it comes to environmental challenges and influencing hobbies and lifestyles. Sounds super cool. And uh, yeah, I will move on to Maria Lindstrom's question. She said, it would be great to hear Johan's reflection on going from visitor coming to the website on a regular basis versus taking the step to build vertical community model. Where to start, uh, where to get started? Uh, yeah, there is no easy answer to that. It, it's, uh, I say, grinding. Uh, try, try a lot of things, and and 
expect nine, 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 nine out of 10 features you build to not be successful. That That's how brutal it is, don't. And but one thing I would say, uh, something I wish we did more more in the beginning was spend time with, I uh, think you touched upon on Nine before, is that spend time with customers. Uh, we were, and this, this, this is my mistake with background mathematics, I think we were too da data driven too early. I think we would have benefited more from doing qualitative analysis versus quantitative. Actually, speaking with speak, speaking with anglers, mm -hmm. more than 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 being data driven too early. Okay. Uh, because again, yeah. it's about product market fit, but finding finding a, a, a subset of users and building a product that they don't not just like, they have to love it. And exactly. I think a lot of startup making the mistake of trying to go after they. Because they are told by the investors, to, they ask them about what's the time, what's the total addressable market, yeah. and then they they try to go after that immediately, which is the, the I think that's the worst mistake. I think that's a terrible mm. mistake. I think it's by finding what's the smallest subset of users that you can go after and build a product that they love, not like. Yeah. Like is not cutting it these days. And make sure that they love it. And only then should you expand to your, your complete time. We haven't done that yet. We are basically eight years later, we are focused on the US market. We haven't started global expansion yet, which is uh, because there are so strong, strong network effects and the higher density we have, the, mm. all the metrics look better. So, so, so again, trying to narrow it down at the slight, slimmest possible cohort that you can go after and build a product that they love and engage with that 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 audience. Sounds great. Excellent Sounds point like on product they love. So I think that's that's a beautiful point. I think uh, yeah. really good, really good. I have to jump in. Uh, I, I look bad over here, but we are overrun <laughs> by four minutes. Uh, some people have already requested and they have logged off. So maybe we can take one. Or I don't know, Johan, if if you have a couple of four minutes, maybe we can take one more question or we can close it. How, how does it look, Marina? I, I can go a few can. more minutes. Then it would be great. Then maybe we can do like a shooting, like just, I will just shoot yeah. the question and you should okay. uh, you answer. <laughs> Let's try that. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Patricia Alvarado again, and she's asking how many users were subscribers at the first round of investing? Zero. Zero. Awesome. <laughs> great. Uh, Morgan Skarin asks, um, Johan, how would you build a social vertical for food and cooking? <laughs> okay. <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> On the spot, <laughs> building your company. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's, 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 well, yeah. Well, one thing, though, is, is this because I get approached at least by two, three founders every week. They say they want to build a uh, uh, fishman for XYZ. And even though I, I'm, I'm, of course, very, very bullish in general, I, I really believe in the unbundling of social, it's happening. Mm. But one thing I've learned is the devil is in the detail. Yeah. It, 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 there are, it, for example, you have to look at the, the passion, the hobby. What's the natural cadence mm. of that hobby? What are the user behaviors today? It, it's, it's, I've been advising quite a few vertical social networks, and you would be surprised how different the dynamics is in these in the in these verticals. So it's, it's, it's you, there's no way to generalize that. You really have to look specifically into the vertical. What's what's the existing behaviors? How can you make that easier, better, whatever, more exciting? So it, you cannot already... really generalize here. Yeah, that's a great insight, though. Like, mm. it, it can work. You have to look into it, though. It uh, won't yeah. be the same as yours. Uh, the last question will be from Peter Huskin, who's asking, how important is segmentation customers via the software like Grays and Link? Uh, I didn't understand uh, the question. I, did. Uh, I do. Yeah, so it, it, it matters. <laughs> At the stage we are right now, Super important. So we 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 use a brace for CRM and we do segmentation because that that those tools are made for optimizations, not for innovation. Mm, mm. I think actually some companies they bring on too many tools too early uh, because that's that's only recently did we I think a year ago we implemented brace. Didn't have it before. We didn't need we didn't need it because it was so much less about optimizing things than actually innovating. Yeah. So I think these tools are, some of them are great, but be careful not 
to have a too complex uh, tech stack and too many tools and making sure what you're optimizing for right now. And in the early days, you're not optimizing on the very, on the few percentage point. You're, mm. you're talking about tens, ten. you want to improve retention with 50%, not with 5% or with 0.5% where we are right now or something like that. So there are great tools there, but make sure you implement them at the right time. And mostly I actually see companies implement too many tools, technology too early. Thank you so much. That was it Brilliant. for today. Brilliant. Thank Brilliant. you. So, I think great, yes. great learning on that, uh, on tools. I think even at early or mid stage or whatever area of the startup you're working, keep it simple, keep focus on execution and keep the passion going and drive forward. So too much tools. I think that's a very good point that you make over there. Uh, Big thank you, Johan and uh, Fishbrain, for being here today. Big thank you from Startup Grind Stockholm community. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marina, for taking the questions. Thank you, the community that has been out there and uh, raising the questions and uh, sticking with us and uh, following the discussion. Thank you all. Everyone, you're awesome.